does God love everyone, or does God only love Christians? And what's the Calvinist answer to this? Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christianity. And today, I'm going to be addressing uh, the question of, does God love everyone? Or does God only love Christians, or those who are saved, or, or the elect, as Calvinists would say? And I'm trying to give the Calvinist perspective on this. So, many people have assumed that Calvinists believe God only loves the elect, since the idea of, uh, the, the Calvinist idea of salvation is that God has determined who will be saved. Salvation is not based on a free will choice. So, that has led many to conclude Calvinists don't think God loves everyone. And, admittedly, I don't blame them for believing that, because there are a lot of modern people who call themselves Calvinists who don't think God loves everyone, who thinks that, who think that, you know, God only really loves the elect. So there has been a bit of a debate um, within Calvinism on this point based on how I address the issue. Obviously, um, you can assume I am of the same opinion as the vast, vast majority of Christians throughout all of church history, which is that God does indeed love everyone, whether they believe in him or not. God does call everyone to believe, and um, the only reason people are damned is not because God hates them, it's because they uh, chose not to believe the gospel. Or rather, um, I guess a more Calvinist answer is they're condemned based on their sin, and because God did not predestine them to believe the gospel, uh, they don't have any salvation from that. But the thing that condemns them to hell is not the fact that God predestined them to be damned, it's the fact it's because of their sin and they were not predestined to be saved. So that's the more traditional Calvinist answer. There's also, but there's the hyper-Calvinist answer, which is that, yeah, God literally just created them for the sake of damning them, does not love them at all in any sense, and their only purpose is uh, to be an example of God's judgment. Uh, now, of course, all Calvinists would say that, yes, God is glorified in judging, um, judging the unrighteous, but that's not the only reason they exist. God still created them and loves them as his creation. So, the answer is yes. Even from a traditional Calvinist perspective, it can still be rightly said that God loves everyone. Uh, so, this debate in Calvinism is uh, sort of infralapsarianism versus supralapsarianism, and all hyper-Calvinists are supralapsarians, but not all supralapsarians are hyper-Calvinists. But I think hyper-Calvinism is just the logical conclusion of supralapsarianism. So, those two words are really fancy, complicated words. The thing theologians are best at is giving, you know, fancy, complicated words for simple and easily understandable things. So, even if you have never heard those words before, if you know what, if you've heard of Calvinism, you probably instinctively know what they mean. So, Westboro Baptist Church, for example, if you can even call them a church, is a radical, extreme example of supralapsarianism. Um, now, I'm not saying anyone who's a supralapsarian is uh, part of Westboro Baptist Church, or is like them, or should be compared to them, but I'm just saying, supralapsarianism is the idea that God only... Uh, that God willed the fall to happen in order to justify those whom he had already predestined to be damned. So basically, he predestines some to be saved and some to be damned, and then causes the fall to happen to justify uh, saving the elect and damning the non-elect. That's superlapsarianism. So infralapsarianism is what Calvin himself taught, and it's been the majority position in Calvinism, in traditional Calvinism at least. On internet Calvinism you'll find superlapsarianism more common, but infralapsarianism is the idea that predestination, God predestining some and not others, is in view of the fact that all have, or for, since God is outside of time, that all will fall. So infralapsarianism sees the fall as more of something that the fall is more of a free will choice, kind of. I think the Westminster Confession of Faith says that all men are completely responsible for the fall. And St. Augustine taught that before the fall, man was able to um, was able to sin and able not to sin, but after the fall, man was only able to sin and was not able to not sin. So, uh, 
an infralapsarian or a traditional Calvinist understanding of the fall is that, yes, no one is condemned except on the basis of their own sin. Some people are predestined to be saved from that sin, and some are not. But God did not cause the fall. God did not create anyone just for the sake of damning them. So um, it's not. Some people think they're super lapsarians uh, that I've talked to when they're actually not. Uh, so what I should tell people is that it does not talk about the chronological order of things. Some people call themselves super lapsarians, super lapsarians because they think it means predestination happened before the fall. Now, of course, that that's true because God predestined us before the foundation of the world. But even in infralapsarianism chronologically predestination is uh, first, but logically speaking, um, the fall comes first. The fall comes first in sort of the logic of how, um, of how salvation works. So you would say it, uh, the Lapsarian debate deals with not the chronological order of God's decrees, but just the, the logical order of God's decrees. So yeah, it's not a debate over which came first, um, predestination or the fall. All Calvinists agree that predestination is something that happened before the earth was created. The debate is over, is predestination in view of the fact that all men will fall, all men will fall, or was the fall ordained by God in order to justify saving some and damning others? And so basically, Calvin had the infralapsarian position that, you know, God still loves everyone, even if not in the same way, but God did not create anyone just for the sake of damning them. But I think his successor, Theodore Beza, um, he was more of a superlapsarian, and then throughout all of Calvinist history there was kind of a debate, even though the vast majority of all Calvinist theologians have still been infralapsarian, I think the the Westminster Confession of Faith is worded more in an infralapsarian way because it says that the fall is man's fault. Um, but I think there were still some superlapsarians on the board of who wrote the Westminster Confession. Look, if you want a, a description of the the two lapsarian views, I highly recommend Jordan, Dr. Jordan B. Cooper. Even though he's a Lutheran, he probably describes it better than I just did just now. Um, so yeah, I, I really highly recommend basically anything by Jordan Cooper. He's a really brilliant theologian. And yes, he is Lutheran, and he does criticize uh, Calvinists sometimes, but his criticisms are honestly things that we need to hear, um, that we Calvinists need to hear. And he's always careful not to strawman us. He's always careful to distinguish between this modern internet Calvinism that we see from, like, um, well, just most of the Calvinists you've probably interacted with on the internet are what we'd call super lapsarians, but um, most, you know, confessional historical Calvinism has been infralapsarian. So, um, if God does, if God loves everyone, does he extend his grace to everyone? So that's where um, Calvinist theologians have coined the term common grace which is that there's a common grace of God that extends to all, because the Bible says God causes the rain to fall on both the just and the unjust. So even those who are not elect or saved still have some measure of God's grace. There still is some common grace. The fact that, you know, the sun rises every morning, or the fact that they live in this world, or they can experience legitimate um, earthly benefits. So that's that's what that's what common grace is. But saving grace is that's the kind of grace that we would say does, is not extended to everyone, and to those whom it is extended is irresistible. So both um, Calvinists and Lutherans agree that um, God extends some sort of grace to all people, um, but Calvinists would say that God's saving grace is irresistible, and Lutherans would say that God's saving grace is resistible. So irresistible grace is a Calvinist doctrine, not a Lutheran doctrine. Now Lutherans are not Arminians. They don't believe that if someone is saved, it's based on their own free will choice. They'd say if someone's saved, it's because God predestined them to be saved. But 
when if someone's not saved, they wouldn't say it's because God didn't predestine them to be saved. They would say it's because they resisted God's saving grace. And that creates a mystery. That creates a paradox. And every single Lutheran I've talked to has said, yes, it's a mystery. It's a paradox. We shouldn't try to explain it rationally the way both Calvinists and Arminians do. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit of a side note. So, of course, since Lutherans believe that um, no one's condemned but on the grounds of them rejecting God's saving grace... And, of course, Arminians believe that um, everyone has a free will choice, and um, basically everyone, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Baptist, everyone except um, those with a Calvinist view of salvation have unquestionably asserted that, yes, God loves everyone, God wills for all to be saved. So since Calvinists are the only ones who even need to ask this question, I recommend that we answer it in the same way that everyone else does. So yeah, that's about it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you later. Bye.